You know, we live in a society that is just obsessed with immediacy. We have kind of gotten used to the fact that when we go to buy something in the store, we anticipate that it's there. They have it in stock, and if they don't, we'll just go to another store that has it in stock. And, and if they don't, you know, we'll just find it online and, and then get it the next day delivery. And if you're lucky enough to live in the right area, it'll come two hours later. Huh? Yeah? And, and that's just how it works. And, you know, it's, it goes with that everywhere and in all kind of instances, right? If, if we want something and we can't afford it, we'll just buy it on credit, right? If, if I have a kind of a thought, maybe I'm hungry, then we want to go to a fast food place. And, and uh, you know, there's a reason why they continue to grow. For God forbid if we spend more than 10 minutes eating, right? We get there, we eat, and we're on to the next thing 10 minutes later. And if that takes too much time even to get there, we'll get called DoorDash, <laughs> right? Or, you know, Grubhub or whatever they're called, right? You believe, whatever they're called. And, you know, we cost God forbid that we should spend any time waiting, then we come home from work, and there are instant movies around the clock, right, on demand. I don't want to watch a movie beginning in 10 minutes. I want to watch it now, right? And the newscast 24-7, sportscast 24-7, anything, God forbid, that there was ever a minute we wasted. And those of you in the, into computers, by the way, imagine they just made this new computer. It used to take like 10 seconds for it to find what I'm looking for. Now I can do it in seven. That's worth $5,000 right there. <laughs> you know, I mean, sometimes I can maybe save a whole minute on a long thing. It's incredible. Instancy, instancy, instancy. Because that is true in our general lives, kind of in our secular life, if you will, our trivial and mundane kind of daily humdrums. It has a way of spilling over into our spiritual life. You know, there are millions and millions of people around the world that, that recognize that they need a deeper kind of spiritual dimension in their lives. And because of that, there are all kinds of places where they promise you that you can have an instant blessing just kind of do this and you anticipate it is like a divine being, whatever that you may call that. And you put it in a slot machine, and, you drink, and then, boom, here comes the blessing. And there's a lot of that kind of stuff that's been, oh, God forbid that we should spend hours in, in long Bible studies and in, in deep reflection and in, in extended kind of consideration where we are, we are learning things from from what we read and from what we reread and from what we pray through and from what we experience that we may know how to recognize God in a better way. What we want is just add water, stir it twice, and here it is. You know, for spiritual life, we're not good with waiting any place, not even there. So what are we going to do when God says wait? What are we going to do when the Bible again and again says that God will do things in his timing? That God will do things in the way that suits his purposes, not in our timing and according to our purposes. I, I meet Christians sometimes, even some that have been Christians for a long time, and they are more eager to express what they really like, what they desire, what they think should happen, than they are in highlighting the importance of waiting and listening and make sure we have really heard what God is saying. So as we talked last Sunday about, about what to do and how to search for God when he seems absent, the text that we are dealing with this morning takes a step further. And we asked last time, what can we learn from the prophet Habakkuk about this matter? And we're going to ask that same question here today, just from chapter 2. And I'm going to read the first four verses. And if you will follow along, either in your own uh, copy of God's Word or here on the screen. 
Habakkuk put it this way, I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the outlook tower, or lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should conclude or reply about my complaint. This kind of rounds up the first chapter where he was saying, I don't know, I'm confused. I don't know what the world's going on. And then he recognized maybe it is him that hadn't understood. And so he decided to do it. Then God's answer comes. The Lord answered me. Write down this vision. Clearly inscribe it on tablets so, no one, uh, so one can easily read it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time, or maybe better translated, the vision awaits the appointed time. It testifies about the end, and it will not lie, though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. Look, his ego, ego is inflated. He is without integrity, but the righteous will live by faith. So, what are we going to do when God says, wait? You know, it's pretty, pretty natural for you to say, hey, 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 it doesn't make any sense. You know, surely, surely, why am I supposed to wait for God? He, is, he can't be slower than I am. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. And, and of course, no, it doesn't. Because that is not the point. The point is not for you to wait for God because God kind of slow in the uptick, so to speak. In reality, you are not waiting for God. God is waiting for you to recognize and to kind of understand what is going on around you and how he uses the events of your life and your circumstance in a way that will truly bring blessing and peace. Just think about it for a moment, right? One side of God's weight really is about how you begin to understand. He has to kind of wait for you to grasp what is going on, to, to give time for you to seek him that you learn to understand what he's doing, that you can recognize his voice when it speaks and not just follow other voices. The other side has to do with, with him guiding you to wait and act at the right time, at the opportune time. You know, this is difficult. I'm not suggesting, friends, that this is easy. It's easy to say. It's easy to talk about. It's easy to say, ah, yeah, I get it, until reality reveals that, yeah, yeah, you didn't. <laughs> it's just not easy to truly grasp it. Why does God delay? Why is he letting us wait? It is because both the circumstances and you yourself is being prepared for what he is going to do, what he will lead you through, so to speak. The word immediacy or instancy, if that's even a word, are not words that have much impact on God's way of scheduling. What matters here is the timing that it is right, that it brings out exactly what God wants to be, uh, what God wants to bring out. See, God will not throw you into things that you are not truly prepared to do. You may do that yourself. We do it all the time, don't we? Throw ourselves into things we shouldn't have thrown ourselves into. We reply to an email faster than we ever should have done. I wish we could have withdrawn it. In fact, now they have it where you can withdraw your email when you send it, Right? Good reason for that. Or you send a text and you answer quicker than you should have done. Or you've given a reply to someone who says something and you shouldn't have and you can't get it back. You throw yourself into situations, but God wants to prepare you. In fact, that is what Jesus taught us to pray when he said, lead us not into temptation, 
Lord, teach us to wait and delay until we have understood what it is that you are saying that we will not go in a wrong way that violates your will. That is, we're tempted to do our thing rather than, than your thing. That's what happens. And so, here's the struggle. We're human beings. Yes, we know what we want to do, and we feel like, well, I got kind of to be over you. I understand what's going on, so I can make decisions. And God says, wait, 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 wait. Maybe you haven't understood everything. Maybe you don't see it all. That is exactly, friends, what is going on in Habakkuk's situation. We talked about it last Sunday a little bit. God, I need you to do something now. That was his cry. I, I see what's going on. That's crazy. There's no way you can allow that. Do this. And God said, wait, wait. I'm still in control. I'm not lost my understanding of what's going on. I see the problem. But trust me, the solution I bring will be solid and complete and filled with fruit and peace. I'm not doing it your way. Look at verse 3. The vision awaits the opportune time. Oh, if we could learn just that. Though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. This is tough. Not easy to learn, friends. It's just not an easy lesson. But this is the reality, and, and now we're kind of beginning to see why God may say, wait. He does so so that we will have time to kind of see what he's doing, understand what he's doing, and recognize his voice. He does it so that we can see that he can take situations and realities in our lives and change them and craft them so that they come out in a good way. If we would just learn to listen. But it's not enough just to understand why he's doing it. So what, is, what are we learning from Habakkuk here about how? How do you wait? How do you wait when it seems that God is late? Well, the first thing you notice is the attitude of Habakkuk. When he comes to God, just full, fully convinced that God will answer, Habakkuk decides to just stand back, get up, up in the lookout tower, and just look and wait. It doesn't even dawn on him that God might not answer. He knows God promises. He knows he will answer. He doesn't know when, but he knows he will, and he trusts that. The very imagery that he brings out of the text here is pretty clearly what, what he's doing is giving us this image of someone who is pulling back a little bit, getting to a point where there's an overview where you can see details and you can recognize what's going on, a good place to look for what God is doing, a good place to listen to what God might be, be saying. Scout for the will of God. And he decides to just do that. So how? In that very question, how do you wait, is this conviction when, when he speaks like that, I will do this, that God has the sovereignty to work out what he wants to work out. That he has the power to take care of, of the issue, the image we see here is exactly what I just said. And God, Habakkuk had now given his issue, given his problem, given his confusion to God. 
And he now trusts God that he will take care of it. I have to ask you, I have to ask myself, to be honest with you, as I was preparing this, that what is the way I do it? What is the way you do this? Do we trust that once we're giving it to God, that he will take care of it? Or do we do like most people do? I shouldn't say most because I haven't counted, so I don't know that. But that many people do. Maybe most, who knows. We'll pray to God, and we'll really ask him to help us, and no sooner have we said amen until we plan what we're going to do anyway, and we continue to worry about it, we plan it, and so we're not really ever giving him anything. We're not truly asking anything other than, would you please bless what we're going to do anyway? There's not this genuine waiting for God. Worries continue and we wring our hearts and our hands and not sure. And Habakkuk is kind of saying by his words, he's, he's kind of saying, listen to God when he promises that he will take care of your burdens. There was an old gospel song. Some of you will recognize it. The rest of you just Google it. Uh, it says like this, take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. You're not giving anything to God until you let go of it and trust that he will take care of it, that he will guide you, that he will show you that God will make a way where there seems to be no way. That's an attitude, friends. Another attitude, another understanding, while Habakkuk waits, that we can learn from, is that he is full of anticipation. I'd like to even call it anticipatory alertness, that he's standing guard. He is looking alertly and deliberately and actively looking for God's hand. It doesn't even dawn on him in the slightest way that, that the God's delay or the God's waiting means that he's not going to answer. He knows that. So now he has given the situation to God. He has now been liberated from his fear and worry about what's going on in the situation, and that has set him free to continue his life to faithfully serve God and just wait and be in the outlook for God's solution, that it will become visible to him, that he will be attuned enough to what God is doing that he will understand. I think that is exactly what is referred to here in the last line of verse 4. When it says, the righteous shall live by faith. God has his task. You have your task. When you place your life in God's hand and trusted him with your situation, it is his task, if you will, to take care of it. Your task is, is to continue faithfully, devotedly to serve him with all he's given you to serve him with. The righteous shall live by faith. And what is faith? It is the conviction of the certainty of what is hoped for. It is the proof of the evidence of what is not yet seen. We're told. You know, the word that Habakkuk uses here is quite, quite intriguing, fascinating, and full of depth that we may sometimes miss. You know, Paul took that word, and twice he was 
he was quoting Habakkuk when he sees in Romans 1 and in, in Galatians also 3, he is saying, the righteous shall live by faith. And then Martin Luther, the great reformer, took that and said, this fits my life so well, all the struggles that I've had, that I'm going to take this and I'll make that this very center point of my, my understanding of the Christian faith. And since Reformation, that has been key, a key verse for all the New Testament studies. But friends, let me say to you here, Habakkuk had nothing to do with that. That was not what occurred in his mind. Habakkuk was not in, in, in the process of formulating sentences about salvation and righteousness, well, how that works. There was a very different kind of truth that drove his prophecy right here. So I want you to listen to this. For him, what this was all about was that you, any person, that you, while you wait for God's answer, that you live faithfully, full of trust, full of devotion to God. Are we hearing this? The word imona, which is the Greek, I mean the Hebrew word that is used here, is far better translated faithfulness than it is faith in the traditional understanding of how we understand faith as some kind of mental conviction. In fact, it is the exact same word that the psalmist is using in Psalm 40 when he says, I'm speaking about your emunah, your faithfulness, O Lord. It is also the same word that is used in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 29 when, when Jehoshaphat commands the people and he says, you must serve faithfully and wholeheartedly in the fear of the Lord. Emonah, that same word. As you're looking for God's answer to become clear to you what he will do, continue to serve faithfully because that is what the righteous do. The righteous live by their faithfulness to God. That's the point that he's making. Oh, I hope we see this, friends. That speaks to each of you as an individual, to each of you who are listening from someplace else individually. And it speaks to all of us corporately as a church during this time. Think about this, even for this time. How are we supposed to wait for God's answer when he seems to hesitate with his vision or his revelation in trust, in faithful commitment, trusting that he has the power to take care of it, to handle what we put in his hands, anticipating that his answer will come, and it will come at the right time. It, it is the same thing if you think about it for just a moment, when it, then Paul says in another, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. Now, why didn't he send him earlier? He could have sent him before Moses. He could have sent him with David. He could have said all kinds of times in, in the history of God's working with his people where he could have sent it, but he didn't send it until he sent Jesus in the fullness of time. At the very point when languages were coming together, Greek could be understood around, there was budding uh, postal systems, so letters could be sent around. In no time it could spread all over the globe in God's perfect time. But nobody but God could have foreseen. While you wait, wait like the righteous who will wait faithfully serving their Lord. 
you can trust him. I think that's the point. I, a few weeks ago, I referred to, to the incident where, where the apostle Paul, along with one of his co-workers, Silas, was thrown into to a prison in the back, back kind of prison hole, if you will. They had been beaten, they had been whipped, and they were thrown back in there. And what did they do? They do what they can do. They give their worries to God. There's no one but him who can set them free. So what do they do? They serve faithfully. How can they do that there? They do so by praising and singing to God. And in no time before they knew it, God would relieve, would relieve them of their misery and set them free in ways they could not have fathomed. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. You know, he works in ways that we cannot see. But he will make a way for me.